Welcome back to the Lantern Archives. This case is from 1979 and pertains to one Susan Reinert and is most definitely a perplexing one. There is a great many twists and turns in this case, so let us begin. On an evening in 1979, Susan Reinert and her two children, Karen and Michael, left their home in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, supposedly beginning their 50-mile drive toward Allentown. It's unclear why they left that unevening, as they weren't supposed to leave until early the next morning. Nevertheless, Susan was expected to deliver a speech the following day at a conference for her Parents Without Partners support group. But Susan never gave that speech. Three days later, her orange Plymouth hatchback was found in the parking lot of a motel in Swatara Township, 87 miles from Allentown and 97 miles from her home. The police discovered Susan's nude body stuffed in the trunk of her hatchback brutally beaten and visibly dead for close to an entire day. Investigators would learn of Susan's identity and that she had gone missing with her two children. However, they weren't found at the crime scene and had seemingly vanished into thin air. As decades passed, the police have been able to piece together some of the story as to what happened in those three days, but there's still many mysteries surrounding this case, preventing the entire truth from fully being uncovered. This is the horrifying case of Susan, Karen, and Michael Reinert, or as many Pennsylvania residents call it, the Mainline Murders. So, we're looking at a case that has at least three victims and is noted to have a lot of uncertainties. What they are and how things transpired will require a little more background. Born in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania on September 1st, 1942, Susan Gallagher was the daughter of William and Jane Gallagher. Her father was a newspaper business manager while her mother worked as a school teacher. Susan was determined at a young age to follow in her mother's footsteps of becoming a teacher. After she graduated high school, she began taking classes at Grove City College in pursuit of a degree in English. On campus is where she would meet Kenneth Reinert. The two quickly fell in love as undergrads and would marry in 1965 after Susan obtained her bachelor's degree. She then followed up with a master's degree in English in 1966 from Pennsylvania State University. Susan and Kenneth moved quite often all over the country to his duty stations. However, in 1971, they eventually made their way back to their home state of Pennsylvania. Over the different moves, Susan had established a career for herself as a teacher, and she and Kenneth had two children, Karen and Michael. When Karen was just six and Michael five, their parents decided to separate. Although they wouldn't finalize the divorce until 1976, by all accounts, the split was amicable. The two would share custody of Karen and Michael over the years, but they primarily lived with their mother in her two-and-a-half-story house in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Those who were friends with Susan recalled that she spent the majority of her time raising and spending quality time with her two children. The same year, she and Kenneth decided to separate. In 1971, Susan began to work as an English teacher at Upper Merion High School. She was described as a well-liked co-worker and friend with a reputation for adoring anyone she met. She was able to effortlessly bond with her students and inspire them with her empathetic and friendly disposition. In addition to being a full-time mother and school teacher, Susan also supervised many clubs in Upper Merion and even taught a film class. Her hobbies at home included reading, attending plays and watching movies with her children. One of Susan's passions included being an active member of the Parents Without Partners organization. She relied heavily on this support group, especially to overcome losing her mother after she passed away. Susan was scheduled to speak at a Parents Without Partners meeting on June 23, 1979. She'd been looking forward to attending the conference for quite some time and planned to spend the weekend in Allentown with her kids. On the 22nd, Michael would spend the day with his father, Kenneth. Susan picked Michael up that evening after he and Kenneth attended a softball game together. After returning home, Susan called her former in-laws, Florence and John Reinert. This wasn't unusual as she'd remained very close to them after the divorce. During the call, Susan asked if the gas in her tank would last her the drive to Allentown and back. After she was told she'd be fine, she arranged to drop her kids off at their home the following week. Neighbors that same evening saw 10-year-old Michael and 11-year-old Karen outside picking up hailstones left behind from a storm at around 9 p.m. Close to 9.30, neighbors reported hearing the distinctive sound of Susan's Plymouth Horizon starting and leaving the driveway, although she was supposed to leave the next morning, on Saturday, 
Neighbors assumed she and her children left early or were headed to visit her boyfriend, William Bradfield. For several years, and while she was still married to Kenneth, Susan had been having an affair with her co-worker, William. The two worked together at Upper Merion, and William was the chair of the school's English department. They'd meet in private and try to keep their relationship from interfering with their careers. However, she would tell several people she was deeply in love and hoped that they'd marry soon. Unbeknownst to Susan, though, she wasn't the only woman William had been dating. One of them was her other co-worker, Susan Mayers, another English teacher at Upper Merion. It's reported William had a secret relationship with Susan Mayers for the better part of a decade, but this was just one of the numerous skeletons in William's closet. So, it seems a pretty clear picture is already being painted. As we're about to find out, all is not necessarily what it seems. And there is a lot of evidence to suggest it's a whole lot more complicated than something simple such as a crime of passion. But what is it that Susan could have been involved in that would lead to her death? On June 25th, 1979, the police received a call stating there was a woman in the trunk of her car in Swatara Township, Pennsylvania. The caller who wished to remain anonymous told them that he found a sick woman in a motel parking lot. The police arrived at the Host Inn Hotel around 5.30 a.m. They spotted the bright orange Plymouth described in the call and discovered the nude body of a woman inside. She wasn't sick though, as the caller stated, rather she'd been visibly dead for an entire day. Her body was haphazardly thrown into the trunk and she lay in the fetal position. Her face was bruised with both of her eyes blackened and her body showed signs of abuse preceding her death. The remains would later be identified as 36-year-old Susan Reinert by her ex-husband, Kenneth. 11-year-old Karen and 10-year-old Michael were nowhere to be found, though. The police spent the next several hours attempting to track down the children, but none of Susan's usual babysitters, friends, or family members had seen the children. Sick might have been a slight understatement. What is more concerning, though, the dead woman or the missing children, we are yet to discover. Investigators would learn that Susan and her children hadn't checked into their motel that was reserved weeks earlier for the conference. The host inn her body was found at was not the hotel she'd planned to stay at. It would also become apparent that Susan had called the motel in Allentown and a woman organizing the conference to tell them she needed to cancel her plans to attend. The reasoning for this is unknown, but would certainly pique investigators' interest. Susan Reinert's autopsy was performed by not a forensic pathologist, but by an internist, Dr. William Bush. Initially, he determined her cause of death was due to either strangulation or suffocation, without having been bound beforehand and the ligature was removed. Her body showed no signs of sexual assault, but cuts and bruises were covering her body, indicating she had been brutally beaten before being killed. Dr. Bush concluded that Susan had been deceased for approximately 24 hours when her body was found, making her time of death between 12.15 and 6.15 a.m. on Sunday, June 24th. This was around 27 hours after she'd left her home in Ardmore with her two children. Months later, though, test results from Susan's blood would find that her cause of death was a lethal dose of morphine. Officials told the Pennsylvania Daily News that the morphine in her body could have killed her ten times over, indicating the overdose was intentional. Authorities began investigating those closest to Susan, but each person saw nothing out of the ordinary in the weeks and days leading up to her murder. Her boyfriend, William Bradfield, even provided a convincing alibi for that weekend, and over the next few weeks, investigators quickly ran through all of their leads. However, in early August of 1979, it would come to light that just weeks before her death, Susan had changed her will and had taken out a couple of life insurance policies, one for $500,000 and one for $160,000, naming William as the beneficiary for both. Her will included her savings along with her $35,000 inheritance from her mother's passing. This discovery would lead police to not only William, but another suspect as well. Ah, life insurance. Who could have guessed? An obvious motive. But perhaps that would be a somewhat premature conclusion. Let's take a look at some other relationships and see if we can untangle some of this web. In Susan's prior incarnations of her will, Karen and Michael were prioritized, and her abruptly making William the sole beneficiary raised many alarms. However, he had several people in Cape May, New Jersey, verify that he was in that area the weekend she was murdered. Additionally, he had moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico for summer classes at St. John's College. 
What's convenient about this, though, is that he left the same day Susan's body was discovered. Although William and Susan Mayers attempted to keep their affair a secret, Susan Reinert was aware of it after finding out the two were actually living together. And in 1977, Mayer and Reinert would get into a physical altercation in the teacher's lounge at work, likely because they viewed each other as competition. However, Mayers claimed to have also been in Cape May with William, and her alibi was verified by the same friends that verified Williams. The second suspect, besides Susan Mayers, who was never declared a real suspect, was connected to both Susan and William. The principal of Upper Merion High School, J.C. Smith. J. Smith had been the principal of the high school for 12 years. He was a former colonel in the Army Reserves and was described as an introverted man who rarely socialized. However, he and William became friends during the years of being William's boss. During his years as a principal, Jay was known for displaying bizarre behavior. Although he was incredibly relaxed, no one could ever find him during school hours as he'd keep himself locked in his office. He'd often talk to female staff about his experience working with sex workers and on a few occasions was found walking around in his underwear during after-school hours. His office was also described by many as smelling like chemicals. However, he would take a dark turn for the worse. In August of 1978, Jay was arrested for having been caught carrying two loaded pistols and attempting to break into a vehicle. This incident would connect him to a series of unsolved robberies from the years prior, one in which he posed as a Brinks security guard. On the day Susan's body was discovered, Jay surrendered himself to police for drug possession and firearm charges. More shockingly, though, William Bradfield had actually testified on Jay's behalf for the charges, which would ultimately end in Jay being convicted. According to the theory, it's speculated that perhaps William, with the motive of being the beneficiary of Susan's estate that was valued at more than a million dollars, might have roped in his criminal friend J.C. Smith to carry out the crime of murdering his girlfriend, and William intentionally left for Cape May that weekend for an airtight alibi. Investigators believed this theory for quite some time. Jay's personal relationship with William and his unknown whereabouts the weekend of Susan's murder seemed plausible. However, there wasn't much evidence to link Jay to the crime itself. And by this point, Jay was already serving his multi-year prison sentence. This is certainly not the end of this case. As sometime after this, a surprising turn of events occurred that may change everything. But whether this will help finally resolve any of the mysteries is still very unclear. Six years later, though, there was a break in the case. A former student of Williams's, Wendy Ziegler, claimed she was romantically involved with William while she was still in high school and while he was still in a relationship with Susan. After Susan's murder, police found that $25,000 had disappeared from Susan's bank account. After digging, they discovered Wendy had deposited $25,000 cash into a safety deposit box after William convinced Susan he needed it. He needed it to place into so-called high-yielding investments, the fruits of which would be used to pay for Susan and Williams' upcoming wedding, as well as the promised move to England. This was evidenced by the numerous fake stocks and bonds police found within Susan's home that appeared to have been forged by Bradfield himself. Wendy was arrested and charged with theft and receiving stolen property. She copped a plea deal, though, in exchange for testifying against William. On August 3, 1981, it would take the jury less than two hours to find William Bradfield guilty of swindling $25,000 from Susan Reinert, and while he was allowed to return home to await sentencing, a request was made to increase his bond from $25,000 to $75,000 due to the potential flight risk in regard to the looming murder charge. When he was finally sentenced to four months to two years in state custody, his bail was doubled to $150,000 following the discovery that he made threats towards one of his former girlfriends, Susan Mayers, who had testified against him. This, however, did not deter another one of Bradfield's many love interests, Joanne Aitkin, from bankrolling Bradfield's release and resulting in the moving in together immediately after. Thankfully, his luck would continue to dwindle as he would be forced to withdraw any claim to Susan's inheritance, including all insurance policies which he was no longer eligible to receive. The estate was to be passed on to Susan's next of kin, and in absence of her children, Karen and Michael, her brother, Patrick Gallagher, decided the best course of action was to place the funds into her trust until they were found. 
And while William would be released only a few months after beginning to serve his sentence for defrauding Susan on April 6, 1983, police arrested and charged him on three counts of murder and three counts of conspiracy to commit murder, one for Susan Reinert and the other two for Karen and Michael who were believed to be dead. These charges alluded to conspiring with Jay Smith, who was still a prisoner. Investigators also claimed numerous testimonies from inmates claiming Jay confessed the murders to them. In a fascinating turn of events, several of the witnesses who testified against William during his theft case would become witnesses for his defense in the murder trial, attempting to spin a story of a supposed love affair Susan had had with Jay Smith. This, of course, was never corroborated by any of Susan's friends or family, as opposed to the future husband references she regularly made in regard to William. The alleged affair was supposed to put Susan's life in danger at the hands of Jay Smith for some reason, but when it came to Smith's testimony, Bradfield's legal counsel ultimately decided against calling him up to the witness stand as they couldn't be certain what he would say. On October 28, 1983, William Bradfield would be found guilty on all counts in even less time than his theft case. As per the jury's own admission, the closing argument was incredibly impactful, noting that the need for Susan's body to be found in order to collect upon the insurances, as well as eliminating her children as potential obstacles in his ability to do so. He was sentenced to life in prison for every count. Despite Bradfield's conviction, the case was far from over as the unnamed co-conspirator was yet to be formally charged. On June 25, 1985, J.C. Smith, the assumed dirty right-hand man of William Bradfield, was charged with three counts of murder and after two days of deliberation would be found guilty with a prompt death sentence to follow. This was in large part based on the witness testimony in addition to several pieces of evidence found at the crime scene, such as hair and rug fibers from Smith's home that seemingly matched fibers found on Susan's body, as well as a blue comb bearing the insignia of Smith's Army Reserve Unit that was found underneath her body. While on death row, Jay Smith would continue to insist he was framed by William Bradfield, but it wouldn't be until 1989 that a court would grant Smith a review of his case, which would unveil a number of inconsistencies as well as outright misconduct in the prosecution's case against him. Notably, a state trooper by the name of Jack Holtz, who withheld evidence from the defense, yet disclosed confidential information to a notable crime author, Joseph Wamba, for the sum of $50,000, who then went to write a successful book about the murders called Echoes in the Darkness. This book would also be adopted by a CBS TV miniseries shortly thereafter. Pennsylvania State Supreme Court would vacate Smith's sentence and grant him a new trial as the basis for his conviction appeared to have been rather flimsy, citing witness testimony to be hearsay by parties who had a vested interest in convicting Smith, what with being Bradfield's colleagues, friends, and family. Furthermore, the FBI would conduct full-on analysis on the hair and rug fibers, both of which failed to establish definitive links to Smith. In September 1992, Pennsylvania Supreme Court ultimately ruled in Jay Smith's favor, completely overturning the conviction and ruling the misconduct to have been so egregious that Smith would not even face a retrial. Jay Smith would go on to unsuccessfully sue both the state and author Joseph Wambau, the latter of which, despite the overturned conviction, still believes Smith carried out the murders. On January 16, 1998, after spending years refusing to return the stolen funds from Susan's estate and eventually having said money taken out of his account in a settlement, William Bradfield was found unresponsive in his cell. He was taken to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead, taking all his secrets to the grave. On May 12, 2009, J.C. Smith would too pass away, although the exact cause of death has not been determined. What is known is that Smith entered hospital the day before due to apparent heart problems. <sighs> While 11-year-old Karen and 10-year-old Michael have never been located, it's widely believed that they're not alive. A slight glimmer of hope was presented in a 2009 CNN article. A peculiar photograph was found in Bradfield's cell, and the police believe it to have been developed in 1986. He shows a stone marker that resembles a hooded figure, surrounded by fallen leaves in what looks to be a wooded area. Authorities have not been able to locate where the photo was taken, and with the deaths of William Bradfield and J.C. Smith, it's unlikely the children's bodies will ever be recovered. Susan Reinert was a loving mother who strived to live a simple life with her two young children. However, her blinded love for her charming co-worker ultimately ended 
in a tangled mess of greed, conspiracy and murder. <laughs>